The American relativist John Archibald Wheeler succinctly explained Einstein's equations on relativity this way. Space-time tells matter how to move. Matter tells space-time how to curve. For theoretical scientists to move forward, Einstein's equations now need to be either approved or disproved. Two fundamental rules of the universe, as theorized by Einstein, are that light and any form moves at the same speed, meaning that space-time is smooth, and secondly, that the laws of physics are the same everywhere in the universe at any time. Since the more recent discovery that the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate, other theories counter to Einstein's have been put forward. One suggests that space-time is lumpy, and that higher energy light will feel it more as a hindrance. To put this theory to the test, scientists needed to compare the speed of two particles of high energy light. So you might be thinking, two tiny particles of light, why is that important? Well, you need to take the very large and the very small together to understand the universe as a whole. So far, Einstein's theory of relativity, which describes space and time as a smooth fabric that's distorted or bent by massive objects, has been a spectacularly successful explanation of gravity and the large-scale behaviour of the universe. Whereas quantum mechanics, another spectacularly successful model, describes the workings of atoms, subatomic particles, and some of the fundamental forces of nature. But scientists have never been able to reconcile the two. Both relativity and quantum mechanics are equally fundamental in their own regimes. So scientists want to find a theory of everything that describes the universe as a whole. Several ideas which attempt to reconcile relativity and quantum mechanics suggest that space and time are not actually smooth and uniform, but are instead a seething froth when seen at the smallest scale, like bubble wrap. A low-energy, long-wavelength photon is unaffected by the lumpiness of space. But a high-energy short-wavelength photon is hindered by the froth. This makes it move more slowly than lower-energy radiation, so it breaks Einstein's law that all light particles must travel at the same speed. To test this theory, they needed Fermi, the orbiting gamma-ray detector. We observed a gamma ray burst. A gamma ray burst is a huge explosion. That gamma ray burst produced a large number of photons, one of which had enormous energy, very short wavelengths. Those photons traveled seven billion years to reach us. And yet the highest energy, the shortest wavelength photon, arrived within 900 milliseconds of the lower energy photons. And that's a little bit like racing two speedboats, one through water and the other through molasses, and having them arrive at the same time. It just doesn't happen. Because Fermi saw no delay in the arrival time of the two photons, it confirms that space and time is smooth and continuous, as Einstein had predicted. And it shuts the door on several theories of everything that had predicted that space and time might be foamy enough to interfere with light. And the observations that we've made of these two photons with Fermi takes us one step closer to achieving the goal of having a theory of everything that combines the most successful aspects of quantum mechanics and relativity into one unified theory. Einstein's theory also predicted that gravity could bend light, an astronomical effect as seen here called an Einstein ring. Gravitational lensing is where the light of a galaxy behind another gravitational body is bent around it, forming a ring of distorted light. But do the numbers add up? And can the mass of the interfering object be measured using this theory? 
So we've known for a long time that on the scale of the solar system, general relativity is either the correct theory of gravity or extremely close to correct. But we don't actually know whether general relativity is the correct description of how gravity works on the scales of individual galaxies or of the universe as a whole. So we use two phenomena. Um, one is called gravitational lensing. So general relativity says that when you have a massive object like a galaxy, that that causes space-time to be deformed. And, and that warping of space-time means that if you have a second galaxy behind it, the light coming from that second galaxy will be deflected. And if the deforming of space-time is enough, you can get multiple images of that background galaxy warped into what we call an Einstein ring. And the radius of that ring, how big that ring is, tells you how much warping of space-time is going on. So we used two telescopes to do this. We, met, we took an image of the gravitational lensing using the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, and that let us measure how big the Einstein ring is. And then we used the very large telescope uh, operated by the European Southern Observatory in Chile to measure how fast the stars are moving in, in the, the lensing galaxy. So we took spectra. Um, this is measuring how much energy is emitted um, per, basically in, in each color. Uh, and that, those spectra tell us how fast the stars are moving in the galaxy. Measuring how fast the stars are moving tells us how much gravity there must be holding those, um, those, those stars in their orbits. And so comparing the amount of, of mass that we infer from that with the amount of warping of space-time that we see from the lensing, we're able to test whether the amount of warping is consistent with general relativity. In 1917, Einstein created the concept of a cosmological constant in his calculations to balance out gravity in his theory of general relativity. He later abandoned this concept, considering it erroneous. However, with the recent discovery of an accelerating universe, that constant might help explain dark energy. Dark energy is a hypothetical substance that explains why the expansion of the universe is accelerating. So the universe has been expanding ever since the Big Bang, uh, but What's odd, and we've only known this for the last 15 years or so, is that that acceleration is getting faster, it's accelerating. Now, naively you would expect that all of the, the gravity in the universe, all of the mass, would cause things to, to pull together and, and slow down the expansion or, or have it carry on going at the same rate. You can't really come up easily with a way of explaining why the expansion is getting faster and accelerating. Now, one way of explaining dark energy, one way of getting rid of dark energy entirely, is to say, well, all of that interpretation is based on assuming general relativity is the correct theory of gravity. Now, if it's not, and a lot of theoretical cosmologists have worked on this in the past, you can come up with ways of accelerating the expansion without introducing a dark energy. Now, our work, which we found that general relativity is the correct theory on the scale of, of individual galaxies, tells us that if you want to explain away dark energy, you have to maintain the, the validity of general relativity on astronomical length scale. Another factor of Einstein's relativity is that gravity and space-time will function in a predictable manner everywhere. The whole theories about the formation of the universe, how the universe is evolving, are based on one philosophical and fundamental assumption, which is that the law of physics are valid everywhere in the universe and at any time in the universe. While here on Earth, we can only prove those laws of physics now and on certain circumstances. So it's very important in astronomy to also check that those laws of physics are still valid, where the gravitational fields are much stronger, Recently, it has become possible to put that theory to the ultimate test. The effects of Einstein's general relativity will be assessed in the most extreme gravitational conditions imaginable, at the heart of our own galaxy. We think we know that this object we have in the galactic center is a black hole, but to prove that, to, you know, without any doubt, we have to come so close that we actually have to measure the fabric of, of space-time and, and see that it's that uh, which the theory of, of Einstein predicts. 
So that's the concepts. Then comes the, 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 the question of difficulty. And I have to say, ooh, that was a long path. It was very, very difficult because uh, while gravity is sort of an obvious thing, you stand here on Earth and, and you sort of have an idea what it is. In reality, it's an extremely weak force and the effects of, of general relativity are extremely small. So you have to measure to, to a precision which we are normally not used to in astronomy. Well, you see, the center of Milky Way, where we suspect there is a black hole, has stars uh, orbiting this central black hole. And these stars are our measurement objects, if you like. They test the gravity of the, of the object. And there's one star in particular, which we've been following now, believe it or not, for 25 years. That's, uh, you know, more than half of my scientific career. Uh, with telescopes here at, at ESO in particular, and we've charted the orbit of this star and we know that in the, around this time uh, this object will this star will make it as close as four times the distance of uh, Neptune to the Sun that's 17 light hours so that's very very close and that's the unique opportunity to in fact test out the gravitational theory because there gravity is the strongest the star now moves with about three percent the speed of light or several hundred times the speed of the earth around the sun and that's when these tiny little warps in space-time which cause uh, general relativity to be different from Newtonian theory to be most pronounced. So it took us about a decade uh, between 1990 and 2000 to basically come up with robust evidence for this mass and then in 2002 nature gave us just an absolutely miraculous star which moved so close to this object that you could see it zip around the uh, the mass uh, in a matter of only a few years and that gave us absolutely fantastic information you could estimate the orbital parameters the mass etc and we were fairly sure it's a it, it's a massive black hole now the orbital period of this star is 16 years and these measurements we took here on the then new uh, very large telescope we took in 2002. Take 16 plus 2002 and that's 2018. So our star is coming back to its original very close position uh, near the black hole. That's the time when we want to be there and make these measurements. Preparations for this breakthrough observation began in early 2018 at ESO's Paranal Observatory. Their cutting-edge astronomical equipment was readied to make measurements of one of the most extreme gravitational laboratories at the center of the Milky Way. For the discovery, a combination of three instruments of ESO were used, NACO, Symphony and Gravity, and all of those instruments are unique in the world. NACO is adaptive optics in the infrared. We don't have so many in other telescopes. Symphony is a high resolution spectrograph. Very important to measure at which speed the star is coming to us or from, going from us. And gravity is an interferometric instrument. The only one in the world that can combine four big telescopes, eight meters telescope, with a baseline of 130 meters. So having the same resolution as a 130 meter telescope. And it has, in addition, uh, the capability to do astrometry, very accurate astrometry, so it measures movement that are the equivalent of an astronaut on the moon moving a flashlight by about 10 centimeters. And the combination of all these instruments, uh, interferometry and classical spectroscopy, adaptive optics, is what makes ESO unique. It's having all of them on the same side in a position where you can observe the galactic center in good conditions. So by, by, by testing, by measuring these predicted uh, physical teeny effects, they are a very, very small fraction of what we knew so far. That's why we make, have to make such precise measurements. That's how we can test general relativity in this domain. We need to get very sharp images 
And the best way we can get sharp images is to make big telescopes. But since we don't have these very big telescopes, we combine telescopes. We create a, a super telescope, in this case, which is 130 meters in diameter. Even with the impressive size of the very large telescope, the only way to precisely measure the path of the star around the supermassive black hole took some innovative telescope teamwork. For our work so far, what we've done is we've taken pictures with the single uh, big telescopes, the th single eight meter telescopes, and make them as sharp as you can be. The problem is, and you see this in my hair, there's wind and the wind distorts the waves and so either you go out in space, very difficult for an 8 meter telescope, or you take the 8 meter telescope and you repair uh, the distortions which the Earth's atmosphere does. Like on a day, on a hot day when you travel along a road and you see the flimmering of the distant approaching cars. So that's what we do, that's called adaptive optics and that makes the images with single telescopes already very very sharp. But that's not sharp enough for what we want to do now. We really need to make still better, still 10, 20 times sharper images to see the tiny effects of general relativity. And that we do by taking into account that ESO not only has one telescope, but four of these gigantic eight meter telescopes, and we can bring them together as if it's one. That's a very challenging experiment, but we've done this now, and so we are ready to make these measurements at an unprecedented precision. So we combine the light from four telescopes, the very large telescopes, here in the center of the mountain of the observatory. The four telescopes are separated by 130 meter, which means that our super telescope can make 20 times sharper images than a single telescope. So we have all four telescopes um, working together and in addition to these four telescopes we have a beam combiner and this combines the light from all the four telescopes and this is gravity. Gravity is of course it's, it's the best because we can really trace the orbit of this star very very carefully with really good accuracy so we can now get very nice orbits and uh, we're, we're trying to test all our theories with this very nice data we have now. Two other state-of-the-art instruments will reveal an effect called gravitational redshift. This is visible when light from the star is stretched to longer wavelengths by the very strong black hole. We actually expect that we can see general relativity and, and how can we see that? It's um, actually a slight deviation of how the star is moving and uh, this deviation we can see in, in the first place in the, uh, with the so-called Doppler effect. It's currently approaching us and uh, it will fly away and the, this, this Doppler effect is actually something we can observe by the means of spectroscopy and spectroscopy in turn means that you need a spectrograph and uh, such a spectrograph is Symphony and that is the instrument uh, which uh, will be the one which actually is, is observing uh, the relativistic effects. Now, after an epic 26-year observing campaign, the effects of Einstein's general relativity have been clearly seen for the first time. So the experiment we're doing is extremely simple in some sense. We are just measuring the motion of stars around the black hole. That is very much like Earth goes around the Sun and you can actually calculate the mass of the Sun from the knowledge that Earth takes a year to go around the Sun. And, the, and essentially we try to do the same. We try to measure the mass of the black hole by seeing how the stars fly around it. And right now we are observing this passage as the star moves into this uh, critical curve around the black hole. For scientists, a spectacular show of orbital mechanics and relativity. So what were the most exciting moments in the observing campaign? I think actually it was in the very beginning, about two years ago, when we for the first time pointed to the 
to the black hole and to the star. And actually we've seen that both of them. And this was to a big surprise for us because we, we did not expect it. Actually, it's right at the field of view of what we have. And so this was very revealing to actually see it, that we can go to very faint, that we see the faint black hole all the time in the star nearby. And the other most exciting probably was that this year, when the star was moving so fast that at a fraction of the speed of light, that you could see it from night to night. This was very exciting to see. And the combination of all these instruments, uh, interferometry and classical spectroscopy, adaptive optics, is what makes ESO unique. It's having all of them on the same side, in a position where you can observe the galactic center in good conditions. The beauty of it is that it's a very simple experiment in, in the phenomenon. Yeah, there are some technical challenges that you have to overcome to build the instrument and perform the experiment, but the concept is very simple. You can probe the uh, black hole properties and then you can probe the gravitational field, uh, which is a very strong one and up to now, when whatever uh, tests for the general relativity or this geometrical theory of gravity that we have has been in the uh, solar system and uh, also some um, pulsars, but in this very strong regime, uh, it, it has not been tested. So this is just a starting point for it with the developments like instrument developments and the new telescopes. We will do more and more of this. More than a century after he published the paper setting out the equations of general relativity, Einstein has been proven right once more with the combined resources of the ESO. This is one of the huge benefits of ESO and the way ESO works is that there is always a very strong collaboration between ESO and its institutes in its member states which is very unique in the world because it enables uh, ESO and the, and the ESO members to undertake pro projects like Gravity, which are so complicated that uh, you need a strong team. Well, what comes next? For the next years, we have a pretty good outlook of what will happen. So the next effect, which we will see, is a Schwarzschild precession. This means the orbit of the star will rotate. The ellipse will rotate a little bit. And so this is an effect which we will see next year. Pretty sure about it. Then we come to more subtle effects of general relativity, but even more exciting. This is about the space-time itself around the black hole. So the space-time around the black hole will rotate with the black hole, and so this will move the orbits of the stars yet in another direction. And this is very exciting because this property is very unique to general relativity, and we will only be able in, in that black hole in the center of the Milky Way, we will have the precision to measure that. With the theory of relativity dusted off and placed back on its pedestal, what remains is for scientists to work out what dark energy is and how it affects the known universe.